let's go ahead and talk about institutional hedging strategies. Um, and if you don't know me, Jessica Inskip, Director of Education and Product here at Options Play. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, as a reminder, I only am going to have the chat window up. I'm going to minimize the Q&A and I will look at that later. Okay, so we're going to talk about beta weighting, meaning we need to understand beta. We need to understand how your portfolio looks in comparison to an overall market beta. If you market weight your portfolio, we can talk about that as well. So a little bit different than if you've attended the session before, we'll always change it up. Number two, and then of course, animations don't work. So put them all together. We'll talk about long puts. That's the traditional way that you would protect a portfolio. It's the insurance. You would create a right to sell a specific security or indice or even ETF, but we're that's the basics part of it. We're going to take this to a whole nother level. Uh, we'll talk about covered calls. So we've had those discussions before. We've had previous sessions where a covered call is just giving up the upside potential on a security or a anything that you own in exchange for an upfront premium. Combine those two together, you get the long the options caller. So we'll discuss that. We'll talk about portfolio hedging. We'll even add another layer. So we'll get to four legged option strat or. or three legs all together with the strategy that I'll, I'll show you. It's going through portfolio hedging and of course, save time for Q and A. All right. Okay, so let's talk about beta. Sorry, if you saw my face there, it's someone just said, am I supposed to only see your hairline? No, I don't think so. But if you see something else, uh, it looks fine on my screen. <laughs> so nonetheless. Okay, so let's talk about what beta is. Beta is considered the volatility, if you will, of an underlying security is the way that we we measure it. I'd like to say that it's the roller coaster. Whenever you're investing, you step on a roller coaster. You are agreeing to the ups and the downs. And the way that we measure if it's more of a scary roller coaster or something less scary or volatile is through something called beta. Here's the math behind it. You might have seen beta across if you if you use a lot of tools to look at exchange traded funds or even individual securities, a beta of one is considered a market weight. That's the market measure, or it's a benchmark. Beta is a benchmark. So the S&P 500 will have a beta of one because that's the volatility that you should expect by investing in the S&P 500. Anything else above that or below that could indicate a deviation and what type of volatility. So meaning we need to understand beta or at least how to calculate beta for your portfolio, where to pull that information in order for you to understand what is the variance of my portfolio versus the market. So you're coming into this situation. There was a comment earlier that said seven stocks make up 40% of the market. That is very scary. And that is a, a, a true statement. If a lot of the market is concentrated in technology and held up by this AI narrative, which is showing you know, profits, margins, and there are revenues, there are results, and the valuations certainly seem justified right now. But if that loses some steam, the rally higher may not continue until we have broader participation. So you can protect your portfolio in certain aspects, but in order, before you do that, one, you have to have a view, but two, you have to understand what your portfolio looks like versus the benchmark, which is the S&P 500. Anytime you're investing in something or you even take that step to become a trader, your goal is to beat the benchmark, the S&P 500. And if you can't beat the benchmark, the S&P 500, then you'd be better off being a passive type of investor. So that's why it starts with this. This is number one. And in order to understand the benchmark, we need to understand beta. So hopefully that makes sense. If that makes sense, give me a thumbs up. That would be great. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so here's some examples of beta. This is a beta of one on the S&P 500 and the market beta. They are one and the same because that's where it's derived from. Now, if you pull something like the QQQ has a beta of 1.24, that makes sense. QQQ is heavily technology oriented, which is so 
interesting if you think about it. Even more technology still makes it more 24% volatile when the snapshot was taken, but the S&P 500 is 30% technology. See how kind of the math works out in a way? Um, Tesla is a beta of 1.64, which means it's 64% more volatile, meaning the variations and volatility, I think, has such a bad rep. Volatility just means uncertainty. Uncertainty means that we don't we don't know the outcome of something. And so if there's hot, high volatility, something's going to move up drastically, but it's also going to move down drastically. Like NVIDIA. NVIDIA, when it's up, it's up. It's, it's up. 70%, definitely more than that now, but it's also accustomed to 70% drawdowns. You are taking in, it's a high beta stock because it has a, it's a growth stock. It's a higher risk stock because it's a more gyrating roller coaster, if you will. So when it's up, it's up. When it's down, it's down. That's what volatility really means. And you need volatility in order to make money. You're accepting volatility when you invest in the stock market. You guys know this because it's an options trading webinar. Nonetheless, when we're looking at the underlying securities and we're layering on something like options that have leverage and have complexity, we sometimes have to take a step back and look at the pieces that comprise an actual portfolio and then utilize options to create this harmony around it. It's, like, it's almost like an orchestra is the way that I like to look at it. So I'd used NVIDIA there because it's a rip and rally and something I have in my portfolio. Um, on this example, Tesla is 1.64, 64%. Um, SH is an inverse of the S&P 500. So naturally it's going to be negative one. What's interesting is when we get into these inverse or leveraged ETFs or ETNs, they're called exchange traded notes. They're intended to be day traded. So this is here just to give you an example of beta, not to utilize this for any they're, they're not long-term investments, and that could be a whole other webinar we can talk about, contango backwardation, nonetheless. And then you have something like Procter & Gamble, something that is a, a consumer staple security considered defensive. Therefore, it's much less volatile because of the consistency that there. It's not necessarily a growth security. So it's got a beta of 0.47. It's not going to go up as much, but it's not going to go down as much. And that makes sense. So the point of showing you this is whenever we're looking at beta, you want to understand the beta of your entire portfolio. Or if you don't have the tools to do that, there are tools usually at your brokerage firm and the active trader platforms on the por portfolio piece. You you can add a column that will say beta on your portfolio. And then at the bottom, it'll show your net altogether. So if you're saying, how do I figure out the beta of my portfolio? That is how you'll do that. Normally it will not include options, but that will give you your portfolio outside of the options aspect. Then when you have that, you can understand, do I have a higher beta than the overall market. What does that look like? And you can also probably use that with a portfolio x-ray tool where you can look at your, are you market weight for different types of weights with sectors? So there's, that's a way to do that as well. But we need to layer on options to this. But step number one is understanding portfolio allocation. So you need to understand your correlation. If you have a high correlation, inverse correlation, and then we adjust from there. Next, let's talk about the option strategies associated with it. So a long equity put, I'm sure we've all seen this before, but this is the way that we would enter it into the system. You know, buy to open an ABC put expiring, let's say October 21st, strike of 150 for seven. You're just creating the right to sell something. And you have the right to sell that security or whatever underlying you choose for the specified period. And that can act as an insurance policy. You lock in profits whenever you buy a put and you own a stock that's called a married put you lock it in for that specified period of time. Like you're locked in a marriage, you're locked for that period of time. So you are going to be attached and you pay a premium for that. When you buy homeowner's insurance though, know that I think it's important to talk about this because a lot of times when I introduce the concept of married puts for the first time, it could seem, oh, this is a, a, a complete win-win situation. No, it's not because you have to pay for it. And if you're constantly buying a put for protection, that could actually rapidly, it increases the runoff rate, if you will. You are going to lose money very quickly because you're paying for that protection. So it's going to increase the amount of capital that you actually spent on that underlying security. And if you listen to a lot of our seminars, webinars, we try to reduce the amount of capital 
when they're looking at our longer term portfolio. And this is for a longer term portfolio. But the way that the individual long equity put works is when we purchase it, we want it to move down. We were expecting a sharp directional move more than the premium that we paid. And then we have substantial gain potential and that's how it locks it in. If we bought a hundred shares of ABC at hundred dollars per share, we buy a put, excuse me, where we have the right to sell at hundred dollars per share. And then ABC is at $50 per share. Well, if we have the right to sell at 100, that put has to be worth at least 50. The shares are going to lose 50, but the put's going to gain 50. They offset one another. And that's how it acts as protection. And then of course there's time and implied volatility as well. Okay. Now let's move on to a covered call. So in order to create a covered call, one, this is the way it would look structured in an order ticket. You have to sell to open one ABC call expiring at whatever expiration date you choose for a strike price of 115 in this example, and you receive a premium of five. And we're assuming that you own or you're creating a buy right where you buy 100 shares of ABC at $100 per share. And what this is doing this, if you, this line dotted line here represents your profit and loss. So meaning when we buy stock, the most that we can lose, we call it stock ownership risk is the amount that you spent. So theoretically it could go to zero. Is it likely, especially with something like Apple? No, we'd have bigger, bigger problems, but they can certainly go down, but you have unlimited gain potential. Is it likely depends on time frame? you know, it's get, keep going and going and going. However, that's the risk associated with it. When we create a covered call, what we're doing is capping our upside gain potential in exchange for that upfront premium. Options always have a give or a take, a give and a take, a gimme and a gotcha. The gimme in this case is the upfront premium. The gotcha is capped upwards potential. That's why strike price selection is extremely important, but we can layer these together. So in order to create this type of strategy, one, you have to own 100 shares of an optionable stock or ETF. Two, you sell a call option against those securities, creating really a limit or a cap on where you think it's going to go. You are creating an obligation, so not a right, but an obligation to sell those securities at that specified price, get a premium. That's how that works. Now, if we combine those two together, we'll get something called a collar. And so we'll break that down a little further. So let's say that you've purchased long stock. You can guess at what security this is. And when you purchase stock, your max loss is going to be the amount that you spent on that security, right? Max gain, unlimited, theoretically, because it can go to an infinite price. Your cost per share is $51. Now, let's say you can think about this in terms of portfolio, but for educational purposes, we're just going to utilize this one one security. If you're to purchase a long put, so like I stated before, it's got that cost associated with it, but we're going to lock in a gain or we're going to prevent losses. It depends on the performance of the underlying security. We're assuming you just bought it and now we're adding protection. So the long put costs you $3.20. That increases your cost, your capital spent expense from $51 per share to $54.20 per share. However, you're protected if the security goes down beyond 50 because you have a right to sell, but you have increased your cost basis and you're only protected for the amount of time that you've selected. So that's, that's one piece. This is the basics of portfolio hedging, but there are more efficient ways to do this. Now, remember the gimme and the gotcha. If we layer on the short call, the covered call, so let's say at 60, because remember, when we own a stock, that is the driver of this, this entire strategy. When you are purchasing a stock, it's going to have the greatest delta, some delta of one, and the higher delta is the drivers of the strategy, right? So your goal when purchasing a stock is capital appreciation, period, which means when we are capping our upwards potential, you are making sure that you account for capital appreciation in addition to yield. But that's something to consider because that's the goal when you purchase those securities. So in this example, we're allowing $9 for capital appreciation. We're bringing in $1.35. We can bring that lower, but you're not allowing capital appreciation and that would help pay for the cost of the long put. However, you, there's that gimme and the gotcha, right? So consider that. That brings our total cost down now, since we're bringing in an additional $1.35, 
to 5378 altogether. So what this does is it decreases the cost of my overall protection, but it still allows for some room of capital appreciation cap at 60. And this is where technical analysis really will behoove you. You look for really strong areas of resistance where there's a large area of supply where it's likely that seller will come in the moment that that's reached. Not always guaranteed, but likely, right? But we're looking at this from a gain in a risk perspective. This right here is the options collar. That's all it is, is you're literally putting a collar around your stock, kind of like a dog looking at mine over there. And that's really the, the intent of it. Now there is another way to do this uh, right here. Well, we're gonna go through hedging one more, but I'm gonna show you how we can add on another layer. So when you are hedging or putting this together, these are your thoughts behind the trade. One, you want to protect against a downturn. You are anticipating a decline in something that you already own. Because remember, when you're purchasing stock, you want capital appreciation. You can do one, the first trade that we discussed, which is the, the married protective put that just the put together, or you can do a collar where you also give up the upside potential. So buying the stock at 520, this we're going to add on the layer. If we purchase a long out of the money put at 1250, so this is our married put here. And remember, we're only protected if this goes below 510 for the specified period of time. Creating the collar with the short out of the money put. So this is allowing for capital appreciation. This is where implied volatility threw us some bones because we received very close to the amount that it cost us to purchase this, even though the 510 is closer to the 520, as in uh, the moneyness. So this now has really reduced our cost to 40 cents, but there's another way to do this. We can short a further out of the money put. So this is a put debit spread, but we're just like we capped our upwards potential on the call side, we're gonna cap our downwards potential on the put side. And what that means is we're no longer protected from below 510, we are, but once it hits 4, 480, we are no longer protected. So we're only protected from 510 to 480, any drop below 480, we are not protected. But that's still a good cushion that is, is what, $40, that is protecting you for $40 worth of downturn, and you're receiving a credit for that net-net. So that's something where you can, the short call is paying for the protection on this side. And this, we don't have a name for this, but this is a very, a famous uh, JP Morgan mutual fund does this constantly. It always has the S&P 500. And it's very interesting. You can see it on the options chain. So on OPEX, you can see these huge positions on SPX. And it's very interesting to watch the market on those days, just from what happens when unwinding those. But they take the S&P 500 and 5% above, short a call, 5% below, do this uh, long put, short put to pay for the entire strategy. Sometimes you can get a credit, but the point of structuring it this way is so it doesn't cost you anything. But it doesn't cost you anything monetarily. Remember the gimme and the gotcha. You are only capped to certain levels. It does not protect you fully to a downturn. But again, layering on technical analysis is extremely, extremely important. So this is an example where this actually would be an entire net credit all together. Any questions on that one before we move in? Move on. Um, please repeat the OPEX trade, he says. Oh, options expiration? Sure. So that's a, I, I need to find the symbol of the JP Morgan fund that does that. I believe it's institutional. But on, if you pull up a options chain on SPX, so the index option, and it's very interesting to do this regardless. You look at open interest and um, volume and see really just open interest, but look at where the open interest is and the biggest securities. And normally it's 5% above and 5% below at the time that they place that. Normally there's adjustment, but on the day of 
just think of the way market mechanics work, almost like the way a gamma squeeze does, but the inverse when it was unwinded. We saw that last Friday with GameStop. I find those things very interesting, just knowing that's why the Greeks, I think, are so important. And this is my brain going everywhere. But if think about the opposite positions that have to occur and how those are unwinding in market makers' portfolios. That would be a whole webinar to describe that. But basically, it kind of pins it at certain points. So just look at the number and it pins those areas. That's what I would focus on. I would love to do a... Uh, thank you, Dave. I would love to do a, a whole webinar on that. That'd be very, very fun. Okay. So this is the overall portfolio hedging. We want to go back to the options caller slide. I can do that. Here you go. All right. So moving on. So here's what you need to do and put it together. And then someone had the question, what do I do if my portfolio is 0.5? So we'll talk about that. Number one understand your portfolio composition. You need to select an index with high correlation to your portfolio. Meaning, if you know your beta, you can look, there are so many ETFs that exist. So you can use an a ETF, op, a, an underlying ETF that mirrors an index. You can use an index option altogether. But if you have an index option, know that the short, you cannot create a covered call off of an index option because you can't own the index and let and that would create a naked position. So that is something that may or may not be something you can do. The alternative would be utilizing an ETF that mirrors the index. So there's your options there. You could look at the QQQ if you're heavily technology, but it's also something you can do on an individual security if you feel that there is risk with that one specific security, then you can layer this on within your portfolio altogether or even a sector, if you think there's a risk within technology, QQQ, XLK, there's lots of things you can look at. iShares has all of the GIC sectors. They're all optionable. So that's something you can, you can address as well. You determine your desired hedge ratio. You may not want to do the whole thing. So this is where we need to understand notional value for a moment. What portion do you want to hedge? Is it your whole portfolio, a piece of it? Are you okay with the market weight? Do you want to reduce your beta? Those are things to consider. Keep and look at Delta. Calculate the put and call contracts. So this is the, the math here. If we're doing index options, so you say, okay, I want to hedge 20% of my portfolio, 30% of my portfolio, because that's a technology piece. Take whatever number that is. That's your portfolio protection amount. Take the index level. So what is the index at? The So if you're using S&P 500, around 5,400 times the contract multiplier, and then that will give you the um, amount of index options required in order to have that properly hedged using a beta weight. And then remember, it's an ongoing process. That's it. It is an ongoing process. Things adjust, you have to monitor. And I always think when we're talking about longer term portfolios, it's important to take a step back and think about market mechanics. There are so many factors that contribute to a bullish market, as in it that's why investing is not gambling. The longer you stay in the house, the better you're going to be when it comes to investing. Now, the trading aspect, the investing piece doesn't matter where you fall on the political scale. They all want the economy to do well, and the economy is not the stock market. However, if the economy is doing well, people are spending, and that tends to make companies go up. The point is, there are a lot of moving factors across the U.S. that are really contributing to a bullish backdrop, and that's important to consider, And at least I do. Okay. So that is the the basics of that. I feel like I flew through that, which I tend to say that almost every time, but we've got a good 15 minutes. And yes, you will get today's webinar in a PowerPoint form. We've already got that ready to go. So if you registered for it, you should get a notification of that. Are there any questions that we can go through? Any slides you want to go back to since we've got about 10 minutes? And I also want to take a moment to say how much I really do 
enjoy these webinars. So thank you guys for always having the most engaging conversations. Um, okay. So do, 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 do. I have thousands of shares of NVIDIA. I'm afraid of a crash. Well, Leonard, I feel like you might have a lot because of the split that's there. When you have NVIDIA, know that you are absolutely accepting the risk of those 70% drawdowns. I still am a firm believer in NVIDIA because the revenues are coming through. They have expanded beyond the... Uh, the just the chips and now they're going into enterprise solutions and they're scaling when that stops and loses steam that's when i would be concerned but apple just came into the ai race and if you go back through all of the components needed for that ai race part of it is nvidia so at one point yes it could lose some steam if it's a high concentration of your portfolio as hard as it seems, it's okay to sell off some of that, lock in those gains, even your from your original investment. And that's a way to make sure that you will not lose money is by, of course, exiting the position. But if you feel like there's more room to run, it's okay too. It's all about balance, but you do have concentration risk. And if you have concentration risk, covered calls can certainly help, but then you give up upside potential. And that's something that I, I wouldn't sell covered calls on NVIDIA just because of the upside potential. Um, all right. What will level of S&P 500 be major resistance? Okay, there's a lot here. So can you explain how to determine portfolio beta again? We'll go back to the beta slide. It's on a tool. I'm not going to have, um, I'm not going to bring up my portfolio actually, but they're on the active trader platforms. So if you go to your active trader platform, there is going to be, so I'm talking if, if you have Fidelity Active Trader Pro, you've got Thinkorswim, you've got E-Trades, you have Merrill's uh, Merrill Edge Market Pro, there's a portfolio tool in there. And in that portfolio tool, there is a column that says beta. And that's going to give you the beta of the underlying securities that you own, and it should tally it together. That's how you can find your portfolio's beta. Um, all right. Uh, there's so much here. Did I do a webinar on technical analysis? I have not done that yet. Um, I know I said I was gonna do that last time because that was completely resounding and what everyone wanted. Uh, we have a partnership that we're working on with stockcharts.com. Once that is fully ready and we have everything together, we're gonna do a lot of webinars on that and I'll use stockcharts platform because that's what I personally use because I can run my own scans utilizing the moving averages that I look at. And so there's some really great tools in there that I'd love to take you through, but I'm, I'm not going to take you through that until we have that ready. So I apologize. Um, can you answer some of these questions? Yes, Joseph, I'm going through these. Um, my question is if your portfolio beta is 0.5 and you want a hundred percent protection, do I buy puts to cover half of the value of the portfolio? Uh, well, you could, but you could, what would serve you better is looking at a ETF that has a comparable correlation. I don't think there is a half S&P 500, but meaning you need to find a, a, a ETF that has a comparable correlation and you can do an ETF screener and screen by beta and you'll find something very quickly, very, very quickly. Um, Eric says the JP Morgan hedge is plus or minus 5%. Yes. And how much further down do you buy the put for the spread? 10%. Um, that's up to you. What it's, what they're doing there is I would do it with a clear area of support. So right here, for example, whatever this number is here, that is a clear area of support. David says JPM uses 20%. 
I would layer on where I feel a stopping point is, especially if I'm looking at the S&P 500, because I have my hard and fast rules that I utilize for technical analysis. And when I'm looking at individual security, I layer on the same process, but I would also consider the cost associated with it. So just like those rules that we have when you're creating a debit spread, they're going to apply here. The rules, the way that we would structure this is the rules that we have for a covered call, looking at a 0.15, a 0.2 delta. And when you are having a debit spread for a put, so long put vertical spread, you're going to consider that you want to, you want to make three times more than you spent. And I would do the, literally apply the same exact rules and methodology there. So for the JP caller, are you selling the short out of the money or buying it? You are selling short out of the monies on both ends. So short call out of the money, short put out of the money, long put at or near the money. Okay. There are so many questions in here. Talked about that, talked about that. Can you show an example of buying SPY puts to cover a 7% market correction? That's a very simple calculation. We would take where the S&P 500 is, Calculate 7%, and that's where your short put would be in this situation. Let me have this full uh, one up. Your short out of the money put would be at the 7% drop because that's where you would, you expect it the lowest to be. That's how you'd be protected for a 7% correction is choosing the dollar value there. Does that make sense? I hope that made sense. Um, Tariq asks, if you sell a cash secured put, how can you hedge it? So the way that you would do that, and, and also think about, we didn't talk about the Greeks, even though we talked about Veda, is head, all you're doing here in this scenario is reducing your deltas as well. So when we buy a stock, remember that has a hundred shares represents a delta of one. When we short a call, that's a negative delta. So we're reducing our upward potential. So our, our one's going to go to probably 0.7. We buy a put has a negative delta and it's at the money. It's probably going to have a 0.5. So what are we at? 0.2 delta. So a negative 0.5, so we're at, we're at a positive 0.2 delta. And then a short put is going to have a positive delta, but that one's going to be further out of the money. So we're probably we're getting ourselves to about a 0.5 delta is really what this whole scenario is. Just And I, I kind of eyed that. You're reducing, that's how it reduces volatility in a way, if that makes sense. Because basically if the market goes up, Delta tells us if the market goes up by $1, you have a delta of one, you recognize $1 of value up or down. So now it's a 50 cent move and it's it's reducing the volatility in that instance. There's a, and when you are, you can apply that same thought process with cash secured puts. So I'm going to Tariq's question here. If I sell a cash secured put, how can you hedge it? You reduce the deltas. And the way to do that is an offsetting position, but still making sure that one is the driver. So your cash secured put is gonna be the driver. You're selling the put. You're just gonna buy a put at a much higher price. And that is going to be, um, uh, that's gonna just reduce your deltas altogether. And you buy the put, excuse me, at a lower price. You're selling at the higher price, as in premiums. Um, okay. And yes, when you have, anytime you're selling, you're looking for higher IB. Okay. 
Okay. I think we answered most of these. And I'm going to see if there's anything in here. All right. Okay. So for next week, I think we've already decided on that topic is technical analysis is off the table for the future. Is there's anything else that you guys want to cover? Please let me know. But I really appreciate you joining today's presentation. Did a little different. It's very interesting with what's happening in the market. I definitely encourage you to check out Fidelity's In the Money show that Tony and I do every Thursday. Today, we talked about our market views and looking for broader participation in very key technical levels that would be posted uh, next week on Fidelity. So very interesting to see there. But nonetheless, I hope everyone has a wonderful week and I will see you next week.